All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome back to the world of ETF investing, Canada Virtual Expo. We're pleased to welcome Lisa Langley, CEO and President of Emerge Canada, Inc. Purna Chandak, she's Vice President of ETF Product and Strategy, McKinsey Investments. Erica Toth, Director, Institutional and Advisory, Eastern Canada BMO ETFs. And Julia Howe, Vice President, Business Development, with Horizons ETFs Management Canada, Inc. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us today. Such a pleasure to have you here. It's all yours. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you here today and really appreciate The Money Show, helping to educate Canadians about the fantastic landscape of ETF solutions that we have. Uh, it's an exciting time in Canada. We crossed over 300 billion in ETFs uh, for the first time. Uh, very exciting indeed. It took us 26 years to get to the first 100 billion, and then a few more years to get to 200. And now we're well on our way to being something that investors can appreciate and benefit from. And I would say that I'm personally an advocate of. Uh, the use of professional advice, but I appreciate that individual investors need education and the opportunity to learn from my esteemed colleagues who are all a part of this panel. I want to tell you just a little bit about myself so that you'll understand my perspective in helping uh, and being proud to uh, participate today. Uh, I represent the first female-owned investment firm in Canada. Uh, I didn't realize that at the time, uh, but I'm certainly very proud uh, to have that uh, opportunity uh, to blaze that trail. And I think it's very important uh, throughout uh, my experiences, whether it's been in the UK or Canada or in the US, I am an advocate of women rising in the investment management industry, of entrepreneurialism and of diversity broadly. And I think from that, we can create great solutions and we can help the education of our investing public, be that direct investors or also professional advisors. So we have some great uh, questions to start off, and I, I'm very pleased uh, to talk about some of these topics in particular. And I think the first thing would be wonderful, and we can each kind of share some sentiments about where our perspectives come from. Uh, how have we seen the Canadian ETF industry evolve? And where do we see the road ahead for future growth? Uh, Brenna, would you like to start us off? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Lisa. And to your, to your comments earlier, we've seen exponential growth in the Canadian ETF industry over the past uh, few years. Over the past decade, we've seen uh, the number of ETF providers uh, go up from just nine to 40 now. We've seen, obviously, assets over 300 billion. Uh, and we've seen a lot of different types of investment solutions of ETFs come to market that ultimately benefits Canadian investors. So uh, it's, it's really an exciting time to be part of this industry. Um, the last year in particular, with all of the volatility surrounding COVID, uh, it's been very interesting to see continued uh, adoption of ETFs by investors in Canada in particular. We've seen this through many volatile periods in the past, and we saw it again uh, in, in 2020, where uh, investors looked more closely at ETFs, of navigating their portfolios to incorporating more ETFs, looking at um, thematics, looking at themes like inflation, looking at ESG, uh, and looking at how to incorporate these types of strategies in their portfolio. So uh, it's it's um, it's been quite the growth, both for investors buying into ETFs here in Canada, as well as for, of course, ETF providers uh, bringing new products to market and growing ETFs in this country. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Erica, what are, what are your thoughts about the road ahead? Well, in terms of the, the road ahead, I mean, I'll, I'll start with where we've been, because I think that that's quite important in terms of the, the explosive growth over, over the last decade. A lot of the innovation that's happened across the world in the ETF industry is as a result of things that were set in motion here in Canada. So I think that's really, really interesting. And it's a theme that we're continuing to see now. Um, and just a fun little anecdote, um, you know, over the last decade, while I've been giving uh, ETF education presentations to investors and to advisors, 
I'd usually kick things off with a, a question, you know, what do, what do ETFs have in common with, with Bloody Caesars and basketball? Well, that's, you know, this, this is a born in Canada invention, innovation, and I think that's something that we should be very proud of. Um, personally, when I joined BMO, there were, I think, six or seven providers in the industry at that point. Um, and things have evolved tremendously, as Perna mentioned. There's, you know, over 40 providers in, in the industry now, or 40 providers and uh, over 1,200 listed ETFs. Um, so I think, you know, the, the industry has really evolved from, uh, you know, beta one passive index exposures um, on the equity side, firstly, then evolved by adding, you know, fixed income uh, exposure. And then um, the evolution continued in terms of rules based and factor exposures. So beginning with the dividend aristocrats and with low volatility and then um, options based strategies. Um, were, were put on offer such as covered call ETFs and that reflected you know a need for higher level of, of tax efficient income for retirees and pre-retirees that simply was not being met uh, by bonds um, and the evolution continued with with actively managed ETFs with portfolios of ETFs uh, asset allocation ETFs and then thematic ETFs so with that exponential growth that we've seen not only in the number of ETFs um, offered that are listed on Toronto but also the number of providers um, I think in terms of what's next, there's going to be more of the honest that's placed on the advisor or on the investor in terms of their own due diligence. Now that there's so much product out there, it's up to you to do your homework and make sure that, you know, you understand why you're buying what you're buying and that you're buying the right thing for your own portfolio. It's a long, long winded answer, but uh, no, well, there you go. well said, that's so important, the due diligence aspect. So before we move on to some more points about that, which I think you brought up a wonderful uh, segue, Erica. Uh, Julia, Horizons is no stranger to the landscape. Uh, so we'd love to hear, you know, your perspective on where we came from and, and where the potential could be. Absolutely. Well, echoing some other thoughts, uh, when I joined the ETF industry in August of 2015, we had 370 ETFs listed across 12 providers. Fast forward just six years, a very short period of time, we have north of 1,100 and 40 ETF providers. So the sheer breadth of products has increased tremendously. Uh, as Erica mentioned, it's also gone from just passive uh, index tracking ETFs to smart beta, options-based strategies, even alternative strategies offered in an ETF structure. So tons and tons of options for investors. And then in terms of where we're going, I think that we'll see more and more precise exposures offered. I think about Horizons, we saw demand for alternative energies, but rather than launching a broad-based alternative energy product, we came to market with global lithium and global hydrogen ETFs. And I think that trend will certainly continue. I agree. I think that uh, the opportunity to have more specific themes and a more thematic approach, a specialized approach, if you will, a more narrow definition so that investors can really understand what they're getting under the hood. I think I definitely see that as a big opportunity for us moving forward. So we talked about this due diligence aspect, and I think that that's absolutely critical because the rise of individual investors participating in ETFs through discount brokerage has been very significant. In fact, it was a very big part of the growth over the past 12 months. So I just wondered, you know, what you think about investors and how investors can and should consider cross-border implications, uh, buying US listed ETFs perhaps instead of Canadian listed ETFs, or maybe perhaps not being aware that there really is a distinction. And so I just get your, you know, thoughts about, you know, maybe what we all can do about that or it, something needs to be done about that. Um, so, Julia, do you want to comment first? We'll go back the other way. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, I think this is an area where more education is absolutely critical. Uh, in my role, I spend my day talking to investment advisors and their own clients, and this is one of the biggest misconceptions. Misconceptions. Um, people don't understand that there is a big tax consequence to looking outside of Canadian listed products. Uh, the biggest things are it's so important to understand what sort of exposure you are getting uh, and also what sort of account you're buying that product for. Because as soon as you invest in a U.S. listed product, you are exposing yourself to U.S. withholding tax, uh, potentially two levels of withholding tax. 
U.S. estate tax and T1135 reporting, which nobody likes to do around tax time. Uh, and I think the reason that investors traditionally looked to U.S. listed products was because there wasn't as much product in Canada. But as we've all commented on, over 1,100 ETFs listed in Canada now. I don't think there's any reason for us to look across the border. I think we can, uh, as a rule of thumb, stay with Canadian listed products. Well, well said. Uh, Erica, do you have any, any comments about the U.S. listed ETFs rising, you know, Canadian listed ETF implications, your, your views? Yeah, so I think that over the last 10 years, things have evolved tremendously. Like we have access to way more exposures now than we did a decade ago. Um, so there's no reason to go and buy the S&P 500 US listed anymore. And in fact, like most uh, very specific right. exposures as well, like you, you can buy a Canadian listed product. And um, I would say, yeah, the, the most important um, aspects, Julia had already mentioned them, but US estate tax would be one that I'm constantly having discussions with, um, not just with investment advisors, but also with, with um, you know, family offices and, and very high net worth uh, families, um, you know, educating around the, the ramifications of, of the U.S. estate tax and, and buying a U.S. listed ETF um, when it's in, in a non-registered account. Um, also, the, the withholding tax and, and the, you know, not having to complete the T1135, the foreign income verification form, that's a, another key aspect. But one aspect that I think is really important is that an investor no longer has to convert currency. Um, so you can keep your money in Canadian dollars. That's an additional cost, right? The currency conversion. Um, and I would say, you know, more and more um, Canadian listed ETFs are not only available in Canadian dollars, but increasingly they're available in Canadian dollars unhedged, in Canadian dollars hedged to CAD, and also in US dollars, but traded on this Canadian exchange. So they're still considered uh, Canadian domiciled trusts from a tax purpose. From, from a tax standpoint, so you you know you would get around that whole um, you know U.S. estate tax to 1135, even if you even if the investor did want to keep their money in U.S. dollars. So I think you know currency control is uh, is an important aspect as well. And going back just a second to the the cost standpoint, because I think that's another reason that people used to pick a U.S. listed ETF. Um, what you're seeing more and more now is that you know, there's no longer a cost advantage either to buying a U.S. listed ETF. So I mentioned the S&P 500, but we also launched our, our um, S&P Global Clean Energy Index um, earlier this year, and it's actually priced lower than the U.S. listed product at this point. So, you know, all, all important points to, uh, to make. Erica, I love the currency control. Because I think that, you know, particularly, I know if you're using professional advisor, perhaps they're sensitive uh, to these issues. Certainly one of, on our Emerge website, one of the most popular documents that get pulled down frequently is our tax fact sheet about US Canadian listed ETFs and what the differences are. Seriously, it is, it's in the top three of documents that are being pulled from our website. So I think this currency control you are hitting the nail on the head. Uh, you know, individual investors can just type in the name of an ETF. If it's in US dollars, the conversion's just happening and they may not even be aware. Uh, so a really important point. Uh, you know, Brenna, you're no stranger uh, to this topic. So, you know, I can't wait to hear your thoughts. <laughs> well, Julia and Erica made some really great points. I don't disagree with any of them. I just wanted to drill down further into a couple of key areas where um, knowledge and information is still not readily available in the Canadian market. And we all have to do a better job of disseminating that, sharing that with investors. So I'll focus on fixed income in particular, because there is a misconception that U.S. fixed income is treated the same as U.S equity. That is not, in fact, the case. Uh, we've got some materials on our website. We've got a paper. I've written a paper specifically on U.S. fixed income and the differences in, let's say, government bonds versus corporate bonds in the U.S. It is not the same treatment of tax uh, as you would think about U.S. equity ETFs and buying those from the U.S. So um, please, uh, you know, pay closer attention to not just um, assuming all U.S. equity fixed income is treated the same. There's lots of tax um, 
changes, um, legislation changes, treaty changes that have happened over time. And there are in fact um, differences. Um, so just highlighting a key area where, you know, please do look into that further because uh, just buying a US listed ETF and fixed income, uh, US, US fixed income cross border might not be ideal even in um, unregistered accounts. So um, just highlighting that. And I'll, I'll just add one more comment on um, index ETFs because of course a lot of Canadian investors have historically gone to buy index ETFs down south and um, fees were mentioned by by Erica. Certainly it was a, a much more competitive environment up here. But one piece of difference that is really driven from a regulatory perspective is securities lending and something we often do not think about. Um, in the US, uh, US uh, providers can pocket um, some or even all of securities lending revenue coming out of their ETFs. This is not allowed uh, by Canadian securities regulators. So it is a very different treatment uh, in terms of securities lending revenue being generated within a portfolio. It needs to go back to Canadian investors in our, in our Canadian listed ETFs. That can cause differences in tracking error, right? So when you're looking at uh, one ETF versus the other and you say, well, the US listed ETF is so much tighter. Um, it's tracking its index better. Just know that it may not necessarily be sustainable. I mean, it may not be sustainable for many reasons, but securities lending revenue may be a big reason. So look at prospectuses, whether it's Vanguard, BlackRock, Fidelity, look at prospectuses, even for US listed ETFs for your vanilla exposures, uh, because you're going to find out how much of that they're actually pocketing. Uh, whereas none of us, uh, it's not an ETF provider um, aspect here, none of us can pocket any revenue from securities lending uh, here in Canada. So I just wanted to highlight that that uh, that fact that is often um, missed. That it that's an incredible point that all the revenue gets distributed to the unit holders in Canadian ETFs, and that that opportunity for securities lending revenue in the U.S. can be kept. It's the decision of the manufacturer. It's totally not permissible in Canada. So I can't thank you enough for for bringing that up. So you've all made outstanding points. So let's move forward a little bit, okay? Uh, and, and hope you know that everyone is learning from that. And let's talk about what the opportunity for investors, you know, we talked about due diligence and we touched on that and, and how best to determine which ETFs are going to suit their portfolios. And I think this is a really tough one. There's a lot of new names and new types coming out that may not be as well understood. You know, so what is a thematic ETF or a strategic beta or how do they determine what really is best for them? And I wondered if you had some points and Brenna will start with you and go back the other way. <laughs> sure. Uh, so first of all, not every investor uses ETFs in quite the same way, right? So it's important to acknowledge that right up front. Some investors use ETFs as their core. Um, some are using it primarily for satellite exposures and the core they tend to maintain by direct securities, exposures, stock picking. Um, some use it, some use ETFs for tactical calls, right? So they're, they're or, um, you know, and we're going to talk about that uh, in particular later on, but uh, there's a lot of different reasons for why investors are looking at the ETF market. Um, and so how you do due diligence on that is really going to vary. Right. Um, but don't just look at fees. Right. The, the, picking the lowest cost provider in a category may not always be the right answer. Don't always look at the size of an ETF. Just because an ETF is large does not mean that it is more liquid or better than another one in its category. You really need to go past the name, past the AUM, past the volume, past the fee to really understanding what is in that product. So if it's an index tracking index. Um, I'll call it vanilla ETF or strategic beta ETF, really understand the methodology. So pull up methodology documents. You can Google the name of the index that, that the ETF provider has shared on their website, and you can find the methodology documents. Um, there's often information sitting on the ETF provider's website itself, but really understand exactly what's going on here, what's driving the security selection, what's driving rebalancing. Um, in the case of active, it's like you'd be assessing any uh, active fundamental manager, no difference 
different. That's where you should be starting in an active ETF, not with, as I said, fees or name or, or AUM, but it comes down to fundamentals, right? What exactly are you trying to get? What is the exposure you're trying to achieve even in thematic? Um, and are you purely getting that? Um, so ensure that whatever product you're ultimately, including in your portfolio, aligns to what your objective was when you set out to, to look for a product to include. So um, at a high level, really, that's those are some of the considerations where, um, you know, even if it's a small 5% allocation to a portfolio, I think investors really need to pay attention to what they're putting in because uh, on a bad day, that 5% could really hurt your portfolio. So make sure that you're spending the time to really understand the product that you're including. You're doing that due diligence on the provider, on the product before you actually uh, go ahead and buy it. That's wonderful. Thank you. That's fantastic. So Erica, what, what advice would you give to direct investors, individual investors about how they could conduct due diligence and perhaps, you know, begin that path of what ETF might be best for them? So I think Perna did a great job answering that question because you got pretty much all of the, the points that, that I was going to make there. Um, what I would perhaps suggest to start with is, you know, look at your own portfolio and what you're already holding. Um, I would say to, you know, consider your investment objectives and your, your risk tolerance, your, your potential holding period of what you're thinking about adding. Um, and then I would also say, you know, make sure that there's no um, overlap or any areas of concentration between what you're thinking of buying and what you already own. Uh, so that would be the, the main um, point that that I would I would say to look at look at first, um, and then you know in terms of the the methodology I think that that's really important is to understand you know what what are you holding in this basket that you want to buy what's the methodology the frequency of of rebalancing what's the level of risk the level of income how is that income taxed because that will determine ultimately like what the client actually receives at the end of the day. Um, I think these are things that, that you definitely want to consider. Um, and, you know, Perna, you mentioned size, uh, the size of, of the ETF or the AUM is, is not necessarily everything. Um, but I think you want to be aware of, you know, that, that bid ask spread when you're trying to decide, you know, is this ETF liquid or is it not liquid? Um, so it's not just trading volume and it's not just the AUM that's going to determine the liquidity of an ETF, but it's more based on are the underlying holdings of that ETF liquid? Are the stocks or bonds held in that basket uh, liquid and able to um, support a certain amount of trading volume? So I think that that's important to consider. But by the way, that depends on the asset class and it'll depend on market conditions as well. So these are things that, uh, that the investor should be aware of. Um, Cost standpoint, I think for for me and for a lot of investors, cost is definitely important. So while it's not everything, and I wouldn't always suggest to try and go look for the, the cheapest potential exposure, um, I think if there's multiple ETFs on offer across multiple providers, and if they're tracking you know, similar indexes or similar areas of market, you, you do want to consider fees as part of your evaluation. Um, and just be aware of the different components of cost, because there's not just MER, there's the trading expense ratio, there's that bid ask spread that we talked about as well. So there's different components of, uh, of cost that, that need to be considered um, also. And I think transparency is really key. So in order to help the investor determine, like, am I buying the right thing for myself, for my portfolio, you need to have all the information accessible in terms of holdings, in terms of methodology, uh, distributions, taxation, um, at your at your fingertips to be able to assess that. Excellent. Thank you, Erica. That was great information. So Julia, what would be your advice to direct investors beginning on that path of due diligence and trying to figure out which ETF, you know, assuming an ETF uh, is best for their portfolio? Well, I love that we started this conversation with fees because in such a competitive ETF marketplace, I find the first thing that comes up is MER in any conversation. And as Erica and Perenna alluded to, there are so many other costs associated with the total cost of ownership of an ETF. Uh, as Erica said, bid ask spread is really important, uh, trading expense ratio, operating expenses, and even taxes is one that people tend to forget. It's no surprise, we will end up paying tax, but some ETFs are more tax efficient than others. So that's absolutely a consideration. Um, and then the other thing, in addition to just knowing the methodology is really making sure that 
your product is adhering to that methodology. So if it's an index tracking ETF, checking that tracking error, and if it's an actively managed ETF, making sure that that manager is really sticking to the product mandate. And we're fortunate to be in Canada where I think every provider is required to post their holdings fairly frequently, and many even do it on a daily basis. Uh, so you really can look under the hood and see exactly what you own in your ETF. Uh, and as a result, you can make sure that that manager is adhering to what they set out to do. Good, wonderful. That's great information. Uh, do you each have in particular, um, and I don't wanna make any assumptions, so I probably uh, have a positive outlook, a, a special section for direct investors or you know, we all ascribe to using a professional advisor, but we know that there are investors who want to direct their own portfolios. Do you have special sections on your website or places where they could go that would be helpful from a due diligence perspective uh, and learning more? Uh, Julia, do you have something like that at Horizons? Absolutely. Uh, a lot of our information is very and client directed. Uh, Horizons does have some of the most widely traded ETFs in the discount brokerage network. So if you go on our website, you will notice that on every single product page, you can find out what the methodology of the product is, uh, exactly what it's holding, and that is updated very, very frequently. Um, and then we also offer one ticket ETF portfolios. So for say a do-it-yourself investor who's just trying to figure out where to start with asset allocation and creating a portfolio, you could always turn to something like that to see it, what a general model could look like. Oh, that would be very helpful. Very helpful. Erica, I'm sure, you know, you must have some helpful guides or uh, places where you could direct uh, investors to take a look. Absolutely, yes. So on uh, the BMO ETF website, investors will find a full list of holdings. It's updated every trading day, um, breakdown by sector, by country. You have also um, price and performance history on the ETF. Uh, you have tax and distribution information. So you can see, you know, in terms of how much that ETF is distributing, has it been consistent? You can see taxation for previous years as well. You can see the level of yield uh, that it's paid out. Um, and then you can also see if you scroll down a little bit further on that same page, the methodology information um, for, for every ETF that we have on our shelf. So absolutely, there's a ton of information there and we pride ourselves on being very transparent in terms of our ETF offering and uh, the methodologies and, and what we're holding and offering support to investors. Um, but we also have uh, put, put together a lot of education materials and a lot of um, due diligence um, resources. Um, we have a due diligence checklist for ETFs. So if that's something that the listeners are interested in, I would invite you, feel free to contact myself or any of my ETF specialist colleagues at BMO. Okay, that's wonderful. I love it. A due diligence checklist. I think that makes things easy uh, for direct investors. Uh, Perenna, you know, certainly yeah. McKenzie has resources. You know, what Definitely. would you what would you recommend for yeah, people? Yeah, so similarly, learning? similarly to the largest ETF providers here, uh, we are also. Um, providing plenty of education knowledge, updated papers on our website. Um, so whether it is for due diligence, whether it's asset mixes, whether it's thematic, what's going on in the macro environment. Um, we have a McKenzie ETF blog uh, and uh, you'll quite often find very topical content on there about what's happening in the, in the world and uh, what that could mean um, for different types of investments. So um, plenty on the McKenzie Investments website and uh, we also look to consistently update that. So I think this is a good sign, right, is, is the largest ETF providers in the country um, have plenty of resources. And so if you are feeling um, like you don't have the information you need, or you're not finding um, what you need on your direct brokerage, don't hesitate to actually go to ETF providers websites, uh, irrespective of whether you want to buy their products or not. There's a lot of really great information that all of us have on our websites that can help you in generally um, navigating the ETF environment. Environment. So I think that's that's a great thing here, right? Is it's uh, it's just overall helping all of us better invest for the long term. So that's that's wonderful. Very good. That's fantastic. Positive news for the Canadian investing public. So let's talk a little bit about how this index ETF works. What if I said to you, I don't know what that is? What how does that work? And are they all the same? So why don't you? Yeah, we'll follow the same the same path, Perenna. Why don't you 
you take that one and we'll we'll hear from everyone. Sure. Yeah, no, so I'll, I'll expand on my earlier comments about not every product being the same. That is actually the case in indexing as well. Um, you know, if you, you now have multiple index providers in this country, right? So not everything is, uh, not every product is tracking an S&P index. Not every product is tracking a FTSE index or an MSCI index or a selective index. Uh, and that means there can be differences in terms of index construction and ultimately your returns in the ETF itself. You, you think you're getting very similar exposures, identical exposures, but that cr can create a difference over time. I'll just use one example just to showcase why it's important to really read index methodologies. Um, S&P um, 500 did not include Tesla um, for a good eight months. It was a delayed inclusion in terms of the security into their index. Now, it's very rare that you see a company like a unicorn like Tesla grow in, in uh, market cap the way it has uh, and how quickly it did. Um, and so we don't have that many examples historically when you look at some uh, an index like the S&P 500. But uh, what we did see is a delayed uh, inclusion where you know Tesla was eligible. However, for eight months following, it was not included um, for a variety of reasons. Now, a lot of people don't realize, but the S&P 500 is driven by an index committee. Not everything um, as it relates to the maintenance of that index is rules-based, which is shocking, um, not just to the average investor, but to institutional investors even uh, that we've spoken to. And so, you know, understanding that there can even be performance differences in what you should be presuming to be U.S. large cap equity or the largest 500 companies in, in, in the U.S., um, you know, you saw performance divergence. So when you're looking at products in the same category and you're seeing that divergence, Divergence, it's probably index driven. It could also be provider driven. So, you know, we, we all manage index ETFs here. Um, we all may do it slightly differently. Uh, there is uh, sampling that can occur in a portfolio. So that's where you have a very large index and perhaps assets that aren't necessarily large enough to mirror the scale of an index emerging market. Equity is a really great place um, as an example. Uh, and you might have index providers who try and buy a basket of securities that replicates uh, essentially the characteristics of the index itself. So these are just some areas where, you know, be aware that there can be differences. Um, taxes, one last piece here, and an important, I love taxes, as you've heard, but one, one last piece on taxes, because a lot of indexes tracked in Canada are not net tax indexes which to some of you, you may say, what does that mean and why do I care? It means that it can impact the tracking error, tracking difference calculation that you're seeing. So the performance of the ETF minus the performance of the index. If the index is not taking into account the same tax treatment as the ETF, so a Canadian tax schedule as you know, all of us should be experiencing in the product, then you're not gonna have an apples to apples comparison. And sometimes that might look really good and sometimes that might look really bad. And so really understanding how exactly this product is constructed, the index being used, really important. That's wonderful. That's fantastic information, thank you. Erica, what do you, what do you think about all of that? Index oh, and actually, tools. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. So I wanna build on a, a point that Perna just closed off with there. And that was, um, you know, I wanna give an example of, of two ETFs that are tracking the same index, but if they don't go about it in the same way, that can mean a different outcome for the investor. So the example I wanna give in particular is two ETFs that let's say track the MSCI Emerging Markets Index, okay? And one of those ETFs is going to hold those stocks directly on the foreign exchanges. And the second ETF that tracks that same MSCI Emerging Markets Index wraps the US listed ETF of that index, you're going to get a different outcome. So the reason is that the investor who buys the ETF that's wrapping the US listed index ETF is going to pay two layers of withholding taxes. So they pay the US layer and then they pay the international layer, which, you know, because there, there's that two layer structure, they cannot go ahead and reclaim that. 
So the result is that the investor who's using the direct holding version of that index that holds the stocks directly on those foreign exchanges is only paying one layer of withholding tax. And over the very long term, you're going to see a divergence in terms of the performance that the investor experiences. There's going to be a drag on returns because of that additional layer of withholding taxes. So I, even, even if a product looks like it's tracking the same index and has the same MER, you want to look under the hood and, and ask, you know, are they holding those stocks directly or are they wrapping a US listed index? Because the ramifications can be very important, especially when you go outside of North America. So where Erica would an investor see that disclosure or see that? How would they uh, learn what you just brought up? So when you go on the provider website, you'll see the underlying holdings um, and you'll see, you know, is it the companies that they're holding or do they list one holding and is it a U.S. listed ETF? Also, if you go on Morningstar or any sort of uh, analysis software, you'll see in the number of holdings. So if there's if it's if it's, a, you know, an index that holds all the stocks directly, you're going to see you know, hundreds of, of holdings, whereas if it's a wrapped ETF, you're going to see one holding listed, let's say on, on Morningstar, if you go to Morningstar to check that out, or if you go on the provider's website. Okay. Okay. That's wonderful. M MRFPs you. too, I just say, also check your MRFPs because they have to, ETF providers have to disclose it. They may not necessarily do it on their website consistently. Okay. Very good, wonderful, MRFP, there you go. Uh, Julia. Are all indexes the same? No, <laughs> they are not, as uh, everyone has alluded to. And I think what Verena and Erica mentioned really goes back to looking under the hood of your ETF, checking the holdings. Uh, I love Verena's example. At Horizons ETFs, we actually have a U.S. large cap index ETF, and we also have an S&P 500 index ETF. Uh, so we had that same scenario where the U.S. large cap index ETF did include Tesla for that eight months, whereas the S&P 500 index ETF did not. Uh, and that is something that you could find out by looking at the holdings. Uh, there also tend to be cost differences. Uh, there are licen licensing fees associated with various index providers. Uh, some do charge more than others, so that can sometimes be a cost savings. And the last thing I'll say about differentiation between indices is some providers choose to physically replicate indices, which means that they'll buy all of the securities within that benchmark that they're tracking. And other providers choose to synthetically replicate the indices, which can again have changes in tracking error, uh, can have some cost savings uh, or additional costs. It depends on who you're looking at. Uh, and then it can also have some tax benefits at Horizons ETFs. We have over 25 ETFs uh, that are passive. Uh, most of them are synthetically replicated, which then does have uh, some tax benefit for the end investor. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you. So we covered a lot on due diligence of ETFs, and I think it, it's very important to take what is common language, at least we're using it as common language, and make sure that an investor understands what an index means. And it's really a rules-based system, right? Uh, so it gives a uh, a, port a fund, an opportunity to invest in an area that where they're setting up the criteria. So individual investors can hunt for particular uh, indexes and they can refer to uh, some of our largest manufacturers' websites and get the due diligence checklist, which was identified. Uh, I'm sure each of you have something similar. And then look, as uh, Perenna suggested at the MRFP, make sure that you're looking at that marketing fact sheet so that you understand what's under the hood. Uh, one of the things that is opportunistic for uh, investors who might be having a specific reason is how can an ETF be used in making a tactical call in a portfolio? Uh, and so why don't, Julia, you take it and we'll go back over. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, one of the strategies that I find a number of investors like to use is a core and a satellite approach, or some people like to refer to it as a core and explore strategy. And what I mean by that is allocating 80 to 90% of your portfolio to your core investments. So that may be some of the passive index tracking products, um, perhaps some rules-based products, but they're really your core asset allocation uh, products. 
And then having that 10 to 20% of your portfolio being that explore or that satellite component. And that's where you may make some calls on some thematic areas that you're particularly interested in or have high conviction in. Uh, for instance, you may look to something like alternative energies or more recently cryptocurrencies is something that's been coming up. Uh, perhaps disruptive technologies, even psychedelics. So that's something where you may want to blow it out of the park and that's fantastic if you do, but even if you didn't make the right call and you were to lose some money, it wouldn't totally derail your investment plans. So that's where I would say that investors tend to use ETFs for some tactical moves. And ETFs are a phenomenal tool to do that because they are inherently diverse investment vehicles. So you don't have that same type of security or single security risk that you would if you were trying to select individual companies in any of those investment areas. Uh, and they're also tradable throughout the day. So if you do think there's a particular time that you want to get in or get out of that area, ETFs are a fantastic way to do that. Okay. So Julia, just to expand a little bit further in this core and uh, explore strategy, and I, I love the uh, framework of that, just idea, ballpark, what would percentages be? So if you were going to have a core holding and then you wanted to have that explore strategy, you know, what would an investor be thinking of in percentage terms, ballpark or range? Yeah. So the way that I like to think of it is having 80 to 90% of your portfolio in your core investments. Uh, and then just using that 10 to 20% as your satellite or explore aspect of your portfolio. Since again, it's really about the money that you could lose without derailing your whole investment plan. Okay. Very good. Good advice. That's great. Uh, Erica, your thoughts. It's a really important area. So, you know, can an investor really make a tactical call? So I think before ETFs um, were uh, an offer, you know, uh, you, you really were not able to be tactical. And I think ETFs have made it possible really, to be tactical and express, um, you know, a, a certain amount of conviction. I think sector ETFs are a great example of this. I mean, these were one of the original tools that were used to express tactical views and at the same time reduce uh, individual security risk and concentration. Um, so they continue to be used as a replacement for single securities. Um, so, you know, if you want to take more of a risk off stance, you can go with sectors uh, such as consumer staples or healthcare, or if, you know, you're more bullish and, and you want to go with more of a risk on stance, you go with something like banks or energy, for example. Uh, so we do continue to see that um, sector ETFs being used to express a tactical view. Um, but also, I mean, not only can you rotate between sectors, but you could also do it at the asset class level. So toggling up your equity or fixed income or alternative exposure up or down, depending on your, your views on the market. Um, now this can be done very easily. Uh, because of ETFs and uh, using ETFs and, and back, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, this, this was not possible to do. Um, now, you also have tools such as liquid alternative strategies or factor-based ETFs. Uh, and with factor-based ETFs, for example, you can rotate from um, equity factors such as low volatility to value to quality to momentum equity exposures, depending on what your, your outlook on the market is. Um, and in many cases, I mean, those factor ETFs have been found to provide you know, a very big chunk of that alpha that traditionally active management has provided, but at a fraction of the cost. So that's one way that you can use factor-based ETFs for tactical asset allocation. Um, so you could use it as a replacement for active management, or you could use it combined with active management to sort of offset your, your risk or your, your amount of concentration that you're placing in, in one strategy or in one manager. So you can use it combined with active, or you could use it even combined with, uh, with passive as well. Um, so I'd say Bottom line, at the end of the day, tactical did not work before the advent of ETFs and before, you know, the, the ETF stable or toolkit grew as, as much as it has at this point. Um, and as the list of available exposures grew, so did the number of ways in which we're able to use them. And, and tactical is a great example of that. Wonderful. Uh, Erica, could you give a simple definition of factor based? Okay. Uh, just for, you know, for clarity here. 
Yeah, absolutely. So the way that I explain it to um, end investors is, you know, there's a continuum. You have passive index tracking on one side. You have full ba- full blown uh, active management where the portfolio manager is picking what stocks or bonds to buy or sell on the other side of the continuum. And factor based or rules based is sort of right smack in the middle of of passive and of active. So you have, you know, typically a handful of rules that are, you know, you have the the broad index as a starting point, and then you have a handful of rules that are that are applied to that broad index to achieve an outcome that is different from the index. Um, And typically, I I suggest that you the investor looks at factor or rules based ETFs from a standpoint of what is their investment objective, because their investment objective might be to increase uh, the level of income, um, you know, look at look at dividend oriented ETFs. It might be to reduce the level of risk versus the broad market, in which case they might want to consider low volatility ETFs or their objective might be to outperform the markets over the longer term, in which case you might want to consider looking at quality ETFs or momentum or value. So that long short to go back to the, uh, the your question, Lisa, to answer the question, a rules based or a factor ETF, it's simply straight right the midway point between passive index tracking and full-blown active management and typically the fees tend to be right in between as well so you know on the passive side of the spectrum in Canada you can get the large index tracking ETFs for three or five or eight basis points and on the active management side you might see you know fees in in the 60 70 basis point range or maybe even higher Uh, but the factor-based ETFs tend to be right in between so in the 30 40 uh, basis point or I should say 0.3 or 0.4% uh, range in terms of the, uh, the fee structures. Thank you very much for that clarification. We appreciate it. So Perenna, what are your thoughts about getting tactical with ETFs for investors? Yeah, I'll share a case study, which we've been seeing a lot of over the past uh, few months uh, from individual investors, and that is on the inflation theme. Um, So a lot of investors, most investors surprised uh, by the um, inflation that doesn't seem to be going away as soon as a lot of people were hoping it would. Um, You know, products such as we've got an uh, inflation, uh, a tips product here, Q-tip, we've got infrastructure, real estate, these kinds of ETFs have... um, Um, you know, really seen a lot of adoption because uh, investors are looking at those kinds of themes as well, right? So we've talked about duration tilts, we've talked about factor tilts, we've talked about regional or sector tilts. And so now it's also sort of, you know, the macroeconomic environment tilt, right? And how can I protect my portfolio as it relates to inflation and be able to very easily add that hedge on a portfolio, remove that hedge. So to Erica's point, those tools are there today. They weren't there five years ago. They weren't there 10 years ago. And so investors are more enabled to act and feel more like portfolio managers, like investment advisors. If you do your due diligence right, you've got what you need here in the Canadian market. So even, you know, in playing the inflation theme over the past 18 months, you've seen a lot of investors pick up inflation linked uh, hedging uh, type of products. Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, Is it possible, Jay, I just wanted to take a check on time that we need to take audience questions And I want, you know, we have other topics and things we wanted to talk about, but I want to make sure investors get an opportunity to speak to, you know, our lovely, talented panelists. Uh, Can you answer that question uh, for me? All right. So I have a time check. uh, We do have about 14 minutes remaining in the session. How much time do we need for Q&A? And do you chair the Q&A? How do, how do, how do, okay. I'll verbally relay those questions along to you when you're ready for them. Okay. And I would say maybe five to seven minutes. Okay, perfect. Okay. So we'll do round robin and we'll collect last thoughts. Okay. Thoughts about maybe what you think is uh, a topic that investors are going to be hearing a lot about or something that they should have their ears sharp about. And, you know, since these are kind of your closing comments and then we'll get into questions, you know, I just wanted to say that, you know, it could be a topic about education or it could be a topic about, you know, what you think is next coming on the landscape, you know, that you think would be something that you should pay attention to. But if you could, you know, give some perspective, you know, what what would that be? And I think you each get about a minute and a half. (laughs) Um, Perenna, you want to start us off? 
Thank you. Sure. Uh, I'll say do your research. Don't assume um, that how you've invested before, maybe how you invest in the future. Uh, as we've all discussed, lots of new products available to you. Um, those come with risks as well, right? Um, and how we manage for income in our portfolios, how we manage for growth in our portfolios looks very, very different today and it will look going forward. So um, try not to assume that what you've been comfortable with is what's going to navigate you through the next five, 10, 15 years of investing. Uh, and if you don't find what you need online, don't hesitate to reach out to ETF providers. Um, we all have contacts uh, where you can email and ask for information and it doesn't disappear for us into a black hole. It comes to me a lot of the times and our <laughs> ETF team when it comes to ETF. So I'm probably seeing your question if you send it over. Um, but you know, we, we try to provide as much direction. Obviously, we can provide advice, but we can provide you to resources or, or, or a link you to resources, uh, provide you with information that can help you make an informed decision in your portfolio. So um, do not assume and um, you know, be aware and vigilant. That doesn't mean increase your trading activity necessarily. It just means that you're spending a lot more time doing research, which will ultimately benefit your savings in the long run. Sounds good. Sounds smart. Erica, over to you. So I think one thing that's coming down the track um, on the advisor side of the equation is enhanced uh, know your product requirements in the in the near future. So advisors are going to need to um, you know do a better job of or, or document more their their due diligence that they do and why they're making a particular uh, recommendation or why they're holding something in, in the portfolio. And on the um, end investor. Uh, end of the spectrum for DIY investors, I, I would echo the same thing. Just make sure you're doing your homework, make sure you understand what's under the hood, what you're buying and why, and make sure that it fits with your investment objectives and with your portfolio. And in terms of, you know, maybe some things to pay attention to um, looking forward, I think, um, you know, thematic ETFs are increasingly important. We launched a lineup of thematic ETFs um, at BMO as well. So we have the innovation ETF, we have genomics as Two examples, um, you know, that have been, uh, you know, very much of interest to investors uh, looking to to fill that growth sleeve of their bucket. Also, um, the the ESG ETFs, so ETFs that screen for the E, the S, and the G. Um, I think that's increasingly topical, and we're not just seeing end investors. Um, consider that and, and move towards allocations like that. We're also seeing that on, on the institutional side. So it shifts uh, within asset managers and within pension funds. So I think that's going to be increasingly of interest going forward. So those are two sort of uh, areas that, that I would point out. Okay, that's wonderful. Great, great perspective. Julia, over to you for final comments. Well, I spend almost all day, every day speaking with investment advisors. So I think what would be most useful would just be to share what some of the most common conversations that I've been having recently are. Um, and the theme that keeps coming up is everyone is looking for yield, right? If we look at the US, or sorry, if we look at the fixed income market, we have the 10 year US treasury yielding under 1.5%. Uh, we've got US, or sorry, investment grade bonds around three, uh, or two even, and then we've got high yield, which hardly seems like it can be classified as high yield anymore, uh, which is yielding us around three and a half. So a lot of advisors and I imagine end investors are feeling like they're a little bit yield starved. And then as Perenna mentioned, we've got uh, inflation starting to percolate. So there's a little bit of a sense of uh, worrisome about people feeling like they need yield to protect their portfolios. Uh, and so I would say for that, uh, covered calls are a phenomenal place to look. Uh, they tend to yield you in the neighborhood of four to 8%. And a really nice thing is you don't always have to change your asset allocation strategy. Uh, for instance, you may be holding an S&P 500 ETF and you could sell that and buy a US covered call, which could yield you in the neighborhood of 5%, but allow you to maintain that US exposure. Uh, and then the other area that I would suggest looking to for some kind of sustainable tax efficient yield would be Canadian preferred shares. They've had a phenomenal run. I don't think we'll expect to see the same level of capital gains that we have seen. Uh, but if the credit tone and rates do remain stable, you should expect to maintain that 4% or so tax efficient yield. So another place to look for anyone that's feeling like they are a little bit income starved right now. That's wonderful. That's great. So we've identified a variety of areas for investors to 
uh, look to the future. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Jay, and we can begin Q&A. All right, thank you so much. Um, one of our viewers writes in, uh, I've heard of many asset allocation ETFs that do not hold actual gold. Giving gold being a good hedge against inflation, is it something we should be mindful of? Okay. Uh, who would like to take that one? Do you want to just kind oh, of do I would, this? Oh, sorry. Okay, Erica, go ahead. I would say that our, our asset allocation ETFs don't hold gold. It's um, really focused on broad market exposures. So um, I refer to them as you know, disciplined diversification across the major asset classes. So within our asset allocation ETFs, you're gonna find large cap US equities, Canadian equities, international emerging markets. You'll even find um, a small, smart, small cap um, exposure and then you'll have uh, government and corporate bond exposure. Um, but to get, for example, that gold exposure, if you're looking specifically um, for that, I would say to pair it, you know, Julia mentioned the core and satellite approach before. I think a really effective way to do that would be use the asset allocation ETF as your core, and then you would pair it with, let's say, a gold ETF either focused on bullion or, or buying uh, miners, whatever, whatever way you prefer, as your satellite exposure. So give it a much smaller weighting in your overall portfolio, um, but you can tack it on and have those, those two positions and, and still have that, that hedge that you're looking for. I'd love to add to that as well. So obviously cost is a narrative here. Asset allocation ETFs in Canada are very, very efficiently priced, very low cost. And gold is still an asset class that is expensive to custody, candidly. And you'll see that in the few gold ETFs that do exist in Canada or even the US um, that are priced, of course, above traditional index, right? So that's just another consideration why you don't actually see it today. But when you think about inflation hedges, equity has actually proven to be a really effective hedge over the past 40 years. And so, you know, is it a terrible thing gold isn't in there? I, I don't know. I mean, it, if you're, it really depends on your equity allocation. Um, so sitting in a 60-40, you know, you can look to add additional gold, but you can also look to add additional equity um, in your satellite or your explorer. So gold is just one um, inflation hedge. It hasn't proven to be necessarily the best one or the most effective one over time. Um, actually, a combination of equities, commodities, uh, inflation protected securities, uh, real estate, and so on have actually um, worked out better. So just a note there on inflation. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, this next question came in to Erica. Uh, they say there's 62 and retired with 1 million in mostly BMOs, ETFs, ZWU, ZWC, ZPR, etc. They always like ZMI, but found it expensive. So they bought VRIF. I now see ZMI has 0.20% MER down from 060 how can yeah, so I was going to say good, good news about that is we just recently yep. uh, cut the fees on that one. So from, uh, you know, 51 or 0.51 before tax, and we, we went down to, um, to 25 or 0.25% on the fees for ZMI. So you now have a much uh, more attractive fee structure on that one. Sorry, I just cut you off there. So you might want to finish the question. I, I was really oh, yeah. excited though. So that's, uh, that's something we'd be talking about a lot is, is the fee cuts on, on those products. So we're pretty excited about that. No problem. Uh, they were just wondering how can uh, ZMI charge only 0.20% MER when the ETFs wrapped inside carry so much higher MERS? So the answer is because of our scale in the marketplace. We're the second largest provider in Canada and we have um, you know, very high level of, of assets under management, uh, you know, close close to the 90 billion mark. So, you know, some of our ETFs we, we charge even lower, but it's because we have that asset base um, and it's it's a volume game at the end of the day. So we can we can offer a structure like ZMI where you're buying, you know, you have access to ETFs which are more expensive, like the dividend and the covered call ones within the basket um, at a lower cost. So we do not double dip on the fees. The fee that that's posted is is what you see and what and what you see is what you get and actually i have to correct myself it's uh it's 0.18 percent of management fee and, and not 0.25 so i just wanted to make that little correction there so the the reason we can do that is is because of size and scale and and you're only paying that that posted management fee you're not paying the you're not double dip we're not double dipping and you're not paying the fees on the the underlying etfs which are higher 
Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I would also a, add to that if they yeah. did want, um, you know, more specific information or if they had more specific questions to so not hesitate to uh, contact myself or one of my ETF specialist colleagues directly. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we had a, a few of our attendees here. They were still trying to figure out the difference between the hedged and the unhedged. Um, and they were just wondering which was better for Canadians to invest in. Julia, do you want to take a shot? Karenna just took herself off mute. So I'm <laughs> passing the torch over to her. Okay. I'll, I'm happy to start. Um, so if you don't have a view, some people do. Some people have a very strong view on currency. Um, if you don't have a view, um, research has shown over time, you come out a, in a wash, basically, just even you know remaining unhedged. Where it where it matters the most is international equity. Where it matters the most is emerging market debt or global fixed income, where you know currency impact can significantly um, you know take away from your returns and the actual fixed income securities you're holding. Um, however, uh, I've also seen a lot of investors go 50-50 on the ticket. So buying both the hedged and, and the unhedged. Um, there's a lot of great papers on this um, online, um, blog posts on this online. Um, if you Google, you'll find them, but I would say in the long run, um, research has shown, again, this is not advice that I'm giving, but research has shown uh, international equity and X North America fixed income, even X Canada fixed income actually between the US dollar and CAD, you're better off being hedged. So just some guidance, hopefully that, that could help you make a decision. All right. Thank you very much. Another viewer here, they're, they're wondering uh, the suggested number of ETFs in a portfolio. Does the number change depending on the amount of money involved? For example, a six-figure portfolio versus a seven-figure one? Uh, who would like, Julia, you've got this one. I can start this, sure. Uh, within our one-ticket ETF portfolios, we have in the range of 8 to 12 ETFs, and I think that is more than enough. Uh, I actually caution some people about adding too many ETF lines because ETFs are already these inherently diverse investment vehicles. If you add too many, uh, you're really, really diluting your exposure to anything. Uh, so I think you're okay if you are using that core and explore strategy to have that eight to 12 in your core. And then perhaps you add one, two or three thematic ideas or sector ideas that you'll tactically move it in, in and out of according to your views and your convictions. Say it's not about quantity, it's about quality. So, you know, what we've seen in terms of asset allocation ETFs, there hasn't, there isn't a tremendous amount of history, right? The oldest products in market were launched uh, only three, four years ago. So what you're gonna see over time you will see divergence. You will see divergence in performance. You will see divergence in um, ultimately your investor outcome, right? And it's going to come down to what they're investing in, what the building blocks are. And there are differences uh, across uh, all of the big asset allocation products you have in the marketplace. So again, look under the cover. Don't just assume you're picking up a balanced asset allocation ETF or a growth asset allocation ETF. What are the building blocks? Are you getting the whole world on the equity and the fixed income side? Is it, um, you know, are you getting both your, your gov and your credit exposure and fixed income? Just um, look at the actual holdings uh, within the portfolios, not just what you see on the surface. I would also just want to add something to that. So if you're a very small investor that's just starting out, I think that it's a, you especially need to be careful about the number of ETFs that you're buying in your portfolio. So if you're starting, you know, with with maybe four figures or five figures, you, you want to really make sure that you don't own I think even, you know, if you go beyond that 10 ETFs, that that, that might be too many at, at that size, because you, you also have trading commissions and things like this to consider. I mean, there's increasingly um, with the different discount brokerages, there's lists of ETFs that you could trade commission free. But I think if, if you're not able to trade uh, commission free or certain ETFs, you're not able to do commission free. You just want to be very cognizant of, um, you know, owning too many ETFs for the trading costs, but also uh, for potential overlap. Um, so I think once you get into that, that 
six or seven figure range, that, you know, 10 or 15 uh, ETF um, range, that, that number of ETFs, I think is, is perfectly fine. And uh, I would agree that I don't think you need to own more than that, um, even with that account size. But I would say, especially for smaller investors, you know, those, those one ticket ETFs, you know, one, two, three, maybe even four ETFs might be more than enough. So that's what I would like to uh, close with. All right. Thank you so much. Um, and Lisa, this puts us just right about time. There's one last quick question. Uh, could probably be just a one word answer if uh, maybe we wanted to go around and, and see what everyone thinks. They're wondering, do you see the evolution of market index linked ETF trading fees going to zero? Corona. <laughs> there you go. Never say never. Um, keep in mind the comment on securities lending, right? Um, we can do that in Canada, actually, because all the revenue can go back into ETFs here in this country. With scale, there is no telling how low we could go. Um, in the US, when you see zero fee ETFs, know that it's actually, um, you know, oftentimes it's it's a market, it's been a marketing gimmick. Um, it's it, That's sort of how a lot of providers have gone down that route. But I mean, we're almost there, right? There's product price at three, four basis points in the Canadian market. So what's another couple? Yeah. I would also caution investors. I have actually seen some ETFs in Canada listed as zero MER ETFs uh, as an asset gathering strategy. And then once the assets go into the ETF, there's suddenly an MER applied down the road. So I would say be careful. Uh, will we see zero MER ETFs? Uh, I would echo Perenna, never say never. Um, but at this time, that would be my one word of caution. Erica? I think the other two hit the nail on the head. I think we're good. I would just like to close with a general comment. I think my uh, panelists and colleagues, I'd like to thank you for your time. And I'd like to urge all investors to think about Canadian listed ETFs and recognize that these exceptional professionals represent the largest ETF manufacturers in the country. They have a depth of resources and a depth of product, and there isn't any reason to look outside of Canada. So please do your due diligence, take advantage of the resources that they have to offer. And it's really been a pleasure being a part of the Money Show panel today. All right. Well, we greatly appreciate you. It was a very empowering panel. Uh, we can't wait to speak with you again in the future. Everyone, we're speaking here with Lisa Langley, Emerge Canada, Pranit Chandak from McKinsey Investments, Julia Howe, Horizons ETF Management in Canada, and Erica Toth, BMO Exchange Traded Funds. Thank you so much for the time today. It's greatly appreciated. And have a great evening. You too. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody. Thank you, ladies. <laughs>